Welcome to Research Perch from the Massage Therapy Foundation. Short, practical insights into massage therapy research and how it can benefit your practice. Hello everyone, my name is Doug Nelson and I'm the president of the Massage Therapy Foundation and welcome to another episode of Research Perch. In this perch, we are going to examine a new project called Project COPE. And I have with me on the call three members of the research team who are making this project happen. And it's my pleasure first to introduce Dr. Ann Blair Kennedy. And I'm going to have everybody introduce themselves. Um, uh, Dr. Kennedy, will you do that first, please? Sure. Hi, I am Ann Blair Kennedy. I am a licensed massage therapist, have been for 20 plus years now. I'm also a clinical assistant professor at the University of South Carolina School of Medicine, Greenville. Um, I also happen to be, for the Massage Therapy Foundation, a past Board of Trustee member, as well as the executive editor and editor-in-chief of the International Journal of Therapeutic Massage and Bodywork, or IJTMB, and you can find us at IJTMB.org. I had to get that in there, that's awesome. <laughs> I did. How about you, Nikki? Uh, I'm Dr. Nikki Monk. I am a current uh, Board of Trustee member for the Massage Therapy Foundation. I'm an associate professor at Indiana University in the School of Health and Human Sciences. Um, I've been a licensed massage therapist for, or massage therapist since 02, so coming up on 18 years. Um, licensed in the state of Kentucky. I no longer practice, but am full, fully enmeshed, full-time academic in, um, in health sciences. Gerontology is my doctoral training, and I look at massage therapy for function and pain, pain-related aspects, well-being, and the like. And then I also work with the, the VA here in Indianapolis. Um, on the Tomcat study. So I'm really, really excited to be here to talk about Project COPE and to have been invited to be a part of this really stellar, exciting team. Thanks. Yeah, I'm Smitty Hector Sullivan. I am not a massage therapist. I'm a registered nurse uh, with 10 years of experience, mostly in emergency room and critical care. Uh, but I have moved into the research realm in public health. I have a master's in applied health research and evaluation science from Clemson University. I'm also pursuing my PhD in the same field, and I'm a ma uh, research manager with Prisma Health. I have many questions, but I guess first, that first question would be the genesis of this project. Like, before we get into the specifics of the project, like, where did the idea come from, and, uh, and how, how did, how, what was the genesis? Yeah. So, uh, Dr. Kennedy and I, we don't work at the same institution, but the School of Medicine is connected with Prisma Health partner institution. She and I overlap a lot. We're one of a handful of evaluation scientists in the system and tend to do a lot of brainstorming together. Um, and when the pandemic first started, we started having this conversation about what is it doing to the healthcare providers. Um, we both are very interested in uh, burnout, moral injury. We have a number of other projects that we've partnered together on in the past. And as we were discussing the the, the the quarantines coming through, the work cessations, the volume of patients to deal with. We started thinking about this idea of doing an ethnography on um, emergency room workers, specifically at Prisma Health, and doing a multi-level analysis to be able to do both a, a quantified survey of those providers with some qualitative data, but also hoping to bridge, bring in some pieces about how, what is actually happening at the hospital as far as patient volume, supplies, um, any kind of operational issues. We, after consulting with some of our um, research mentors within the system, including some leadership within the IRB, we decided this wasn't a great time to really recruit from within the system. Decided it was a little bit more ethical to look outside the system and recruit through some of the networks we're both part of. I'm pretty tied in with some of the critical care and emergency networks. Um, Dr. Kennedy and I started having this conversation about what, which population do we really want to look at? You know, because originally we were just talking about emergency room physicians. I wanted to extrapolate from there to be able to sort of talk about what's happening to some other providers because we really had this opportunity to actually zero in and collect information in the midst of a pandemic. You know, we, mm -hmm. when you read the literature from Katrina, 9-11, um, you've made your disasters, you have debriefs after the fact. You have information about the psychological needs of those providers after the disaster was resolved. There's not a lot of information about what is that experience like when you're living inside of it. Right. As we started having this conversation, we started thinking about all the other groups that are impacted. 
Um, and I'll, I think I'll kick it over to Dr. Kennedy to talk about how we evolved into looking at these two categories of the quote unquote essential and unessential healthcare providers. And that really happened because I also volunteer with the American Massage Therapy Association as uh, the chair of governance. So I was seeing all these different pieces happening to the massage therapy profession, not only from the association standpoint, but also on social media. I mean, I'm friends with a lot of massage therapists on social media. And it was heartbreaking to see what was going on for them and how they were expressing themselves in that realm. And just knowing as well that they were part of taking care of first responders during 9-11 and Katrina and in Mississippi during the tornadoes. But those experiences are not captured. I can't find them in the scientific literature. We see them in the professional literature. We see the stories about the therapists who go in and, and work on first responders there, but that's not captured in the scientific literature. And that really needs to get in there, in my mm. opinion as well. Mm. But again, it's after the fact. We're not seeing what's going on during a huge event. And we just started thinking about all these networks that we're connected to. And then I had to get another massage therapist involved. And so I had to call Nikki, like, Nikki, I've got an idea. <laughs> you want to come play with us? We've got some, we've got this great team going and wouldn't it be fantastic? Now I want to mention them. I want to bring up our other people too. So we have mm -hmm. Shannon Stark Taylor, who is in family medicine. She's a clinical psychologist for Prisma Health. We have Tom Britt, who is from Clemson University in organizational psychology. Marissa Shuffler-Porter, she's also from Clemson. Is she also organizational site? Yes. Committee? And we have Sarah Griffin, who is um, one of Smitty's mentors, as well from Clemson University, and her department is... Public Health Sciences, but she's also an evaluation scientist. And I couldn't leave out our grad student who's assisting with us either, yes. Chloe Wilson. Oh my goodness, she's fabulous and wonderful, and she is making my life so easy right now. Mm -hmm. She is from Clemson University as well. Well, I think that that really does a beautiful highlighting of how this is such a multi-disciplinary um, team. And this project and the project idea really is cross-cutting and inclusive of so many different disciplines, whether deemed, as, as Smitty referred to, this essential aspect or non-essential. Um, but being a, anybody who is forward facing in any sort of caring capacity. And there's this really interesting dynamic that's happening. These, you know, we're hearing, we're able to hear some of the stories from those who are on the front line in, in, in the medical field talking about how they are caring for the, the people that are their patients and that they're, that they're charged with. But there's so many folks who aren't able to do the care that they're used to and that they tend to be charged with because they have been deemed non-essential non or for whatever capacity of them not their their field not being flexible to be able to shift and change mm -hmm. the very nature of them doing their work isn't allowed right now yeah. and so this doesn't just apply to those who are currently in our medical care facilities um, but so many other caring um, professions and when and when uh, Ann and I started talking about it we also have other tendril network pieces in other complementary and integrative health capacities. And as we started talking about our brothers and sisters in acupuncture and uh, Chinese medicine and, and other similar walks, that their stories could also be heard and, and an opportunity to gather data in real time, which has never been done, um, could certainly lend to nice reflective consideration and forward thinking as we yeah. move, move step away from this. So, so if I just look at this um, to all three of you from the outside, and again, I'm, this is all new to me as well. So is it that you are collecting data from people like myself who, uh, you know, normally I have a practice filled with physicians and, and people around the front lines, and now I can't serve them. Are you collecting data from people like myself to then analyze that later in some perspective and not just the massage therapy world, do I understand, but other complementary um, fields as well? And, and then that kind of, those reflections will provide a, a, a source of data to, to be analyzed at a future point. Is that what I understand? You're exactly right, Doug. What we're looking at actually is, to me, 
because our definitions are having to evolve over time a little bit as well. Sure. Because when you look at essential versus non-essential, which is how we started describing it at first, and we were looking at who was working and who wasn't working, that's actually shifting a little bit. Meaning, mm -hmm. like when I went to look at the definitions from like the CDC and WHO, dentists are listed as essential. And yet we're seeing them not practicing. That's right. Right now. And so we want to capture that. We want to capture, to me, it's anybody who identifies as someone who works in health and wellness. Yeah. And so, as we mentioned a little bit, this got, this came very fast. Yeah. Very this fast. project is three weeks old, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. It was, we were able to grab this team together, conceptualize it, get our instruments together, get it through our institutional review board and launched within two and a half weeks. It's incredible. Unheard of. Un incredible. Never. Never does this happen. <laughs> so we're really excited. I realized too we haven't actually said what it is. Yeah, Why don't you give a real brief description about what 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 makes up the 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 data collection instrument pieces that we'll be able to ask questions about later. That's what I was kind of aiming for. That so that would be great if somebody could great. do that. The the paragraph version. Yeah. Betty, why don't you take that one? Sure. Um, so, you know, Project Hope, I don't think we've said what it stands for either. No, um, we haven't given them our acronym. Is, is Chronicling Healthcare Providers Pandemic Experiences. Mm. That's what it stands for. Um, there are two levels to this project. Both are, are uh, mixed methods. In the first, we're doing an initial recruitment for uh, an initial survey, which is a single item, uh, just to get an understanding of where someone's uh, burnout, wellness, oral injury is, and then ask them to submit a video blog. Um, which we can analyze oh, wow. using some qualitative methodology. Patient, people that complete that are then invited to participate in a weekly survey. The, if the survey is longer, and a weekly video blog if they're willing to contribute one. Uh, at the end of the initial survey, we just ask them to get the, give us the best email address to invite them. We're also continuing throughout the process to post links on various social media sites for um, a number of different um, health provider and allied health provider complementary medicine fields, um, as many networks as we can. Um, we're going to be able to analyze over time um, with some information about where that person is to look to see what is happening in the pandemic response in their area. What is the local, um, what do the local authorities report as far as patient volumes? And there's also, there's also a practitioner and practice descriptor section on the baseline. Yes surveys so we're able so we'll be able to tease apart where people were practicing from what discipline they were in and we can overlay that with other information that we're able to get from just the public record as far as you know what sort of mandates were happening in at that time in that area it's the the the, the amount of data that is being gathered with this and the potential of all manner of different questions across and compared within disciplines is, is very, very exciting and yes. done like this to my knowledge. I find it and, incredibly fascinating, I mean, this whole thing. And also the window right now, I mean, you can't wait for three months to do this because right. that window closes. So you're doing it in real time with while wow, this thing is actually in the throes of the event, which is fascinating, mm -hmm. but requiring a, a speed that is dizzying in some ways. So I'm sorry. And this is international. So we are actually yeah. recruiting internationally as well, really wanting to find any, the one piece, because we do not have this part on our team is we are requiring people to be able to speak and read English mm -hmm. at this point, which I know is a limiting factor in many instances. However, it's what we had to go with at the time because we did not have anybody on our team to be able to work as, as, lang as a language services type to help us uh, navigate that at this point. Mm -hmm. But we are really excited to hear from those that aren't just in the US and we really wanna get that across as well, that this is international. Since I'm in a way unfamiliar, this is all new. Um, has there been anything like this? Another, I'm unfamiliar with anything quite in the same way. So, is it just me or is it? <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and, we and, and I would also add that it's, Part of this that makes it so unique is, is um, Anne and Smitty and, and the initial team really jumped on this opportunity to really focus on how can we gather um, meaningful data really, really quickly 
and in a safe and in a safe and consistent way. Mm -hmm. And so really focusing on that, we have research questions that we've all bounced around with each other and making sure that we're, you know, collecting some of that information and, and collecting it in such a way that we'll be able to glean that information. But just knowing that speed was of the essence to be able to get it launched so that we didn't lose any any time. But the the fact of the matter is this is likely going to be something that will be enduring for mm. quite some time yeah. and uh, in phases. And so while we missed potentially some of the early the earliest data, it's it it's really exciting the potential that this has. Yeah. And so you're collecting both survey data, but also I think the video kind of video blogs or mm -hmm. vlogs, whatever they're going, it's a really interesting way for people to tell their stories and their reactions in their own voices. And that's really important. And one of the greatest things about the um, software that we're able to use is that if people are actually answering the survey on their phone, at the end, when they click the little box to send in their video journal, if they click that little button, it will actually pop into either their library or their camera, and they can record right there. They don't have to necessarily go out and do something wow. extra special. Yeah. It grabs the video right in the moment. Yeah. So they don't have to necessarily go off and do something extra. They can yeah. do it right then, and they don't have to send it to us later. I was absolutely yeah. thrilled to find out that our um, survey uh, instrument was going, the software that we're using allows us to do yeah. that. It's Trust me, cool. Smitty got some um, capital lettered um, text messages <laughs> from me while I was screaming with excitement. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, they're, they're, they're responding to a prompt too, right, Anne? Yes, yes. They're given three mm -hmm. questions as a prompt to mm -hmm. think on and reflect on for their short video journal. We, we don't think these need to be long, you know, yeah. Yeah. two to five minutes at most. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the other thing, you know, as a therapist, as one of those people, at some level, we also feel like, we are being heard, do you know, like your stories matter and it's our personal experience of kind of being on the sidelines and what that's like. Um, there's value in that as well for the, for the, you know, the recipient in some ways, you know, for the, per, for the person participating. So fascinating, absolutely fascinating. And then, um, so this process will go on, you, you think for a little while. And I would imagine that because this is all happening really quickly, it's a little unclear as to what all the ramifications might be and the things that you might collect and what you might do with that data. But in some ways, if you have the data, maybe that doesn't matter as much because you can figure out how to structure it afterwards. Is that correct? Well, it's, create, it's essentially creating a data set, right? Mm -hmm. And then, so while we have questions that we are interested in examining and because there are uh, validated tools and measures that are collecting burnout and um, moral uh, fatigue, right? Am mm -hmm. I saying that correctly, Ian? In moral study? injury. There moral we go, injury. moral injury. That there's, those data points are absolutely there that we'll be able to look at cross-sectionally, across different groups, from different regions and areas. So that's the primary and main research question. But because there's so much data that's going to be there, all manner of secondary uh, analysis questions and research ideas can, can come from that. Okay. So with, with our research assistants, we've got doctoral students that are going to be coming on board in the fall as well, who are stoked and really excited about the opportunity to be able to dive into some of this data. It's, it's going to be really exciting. And, a, and I think it really, from a, the massage therapist perspective, an opportunity to, I think, be the first longitudinal study in massage therapists ever conducted. And we didn't, I mean, that wasn't necessarily by, um, by design. Well, but. on specifically massage, my other study was 18 months and I did gather data from massage therapists. A repeat, repeat. Of course. Okay. Yeah, that was an 18. Yeah. But that's neither here nor there. Yeah. Um, but I think the other thing, oh, maybe a squirrel just ran through the room and I forgot what I was going to say. Oh, it right. was also moral distress, not moral injury is it what ah. Chloe would remind us about. Yeah. Yes, okay. this is one of her areas of expertise, and so we're really lucky to have her as well. Mm -hmm. um, no, I, uh, no, I also find it interesting because the other events that you mentioned, I think maybe it was, yeah, I forgot which one of you, but, um, you know, Katrina, 9-11, while the effects of those were large, it did, it was uh, kind of ecocentric and it happened at a specific place. 
Mm -hmm. Well, this is happening not just nationwide, but worldwide and profession-wide, uh, which makes um, the both the ramifications and the ability to gather data much larger than in a concentrated area. So I'm sure that changes the game as well, right? Absolutely. This is, is what you call in gerontological land a period effect, right? So when you're looking at people's life courses, period effects are things that happen to everybody, but it uh -huh. has different because of the period of time that it's in, but uh -huh. it impacts diff people differently based on many factors such as where they were, how old they were and the like, but it has ramifications that will be very, very long term. And so this is something too that one of the pieces I wanted to mention that having this data in 10 years, we'll be still seeing some of the impacts that could be pointing to this data that we're, that we're looking at on career on the field and the like. Mm -hmm. But one of the other pieces that I wanted to mention, I don't think that we've mentioned yet, is that we're also inviting uh, students for these different clinical yes. fields who would like to have conversation and, and, be, and be a part of this. So now you've got all manner, you know, in, in the field of medicine, we've got um, medical students being able to graduate early and hit the ground running without, in some instances, doing their, their full out residencies, right? Um, and, but that's certainly not the case for massage therapists and other sorts of clinicians that aren't, you know, so here they've been training and they're at all different levels as well. So the impact on what this is going to do from an educational standpoint is going to be really interesting also. Yes. So just that's, I, I, I realize we hadn't mentioned that student yeah. aspect. You know, that, I'm so glad you brought that up, Nikki, because just a couple of days ago, um, I was on, I volunteered to kind of help out a, a educational institution and their students were just graduating. So they were asking someone like myself who you know, been practicing for more than 40 years, like, tell me about this event and how it's affecting your practice. But what they were really asking is, what's in store for me going forward, right? And um, wow, uh, it's pretty hard to answer that question since none of us have ever seen anything like this. So. Right. Uh, it's so great that you, all three of you, are taking the time and this moment in time to gather this data and, and hopefully serve the profession um, in such a big way in the future. This is, a, it's really an amazing project. We're really excited. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And when, when, do you think it, when do you think it might launch? Uh, it here? launched last week. Oh my goodness. Oh, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. Yeah. No, it's good. Um, so we are out on, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, all under um, Project COPE. And you might have to put in that full term Project COPE chronicling healthcare providers pandemic experiences, and okay. you should find it that way. Okay. There's links to our surveys um, in there to join it. And I think the other important piece for those that actually join us longitudinally and give us their email address, mm -hmm. not only are we able to send you these surveys weekly? But if something else comes up, if we start to mm -hmm. notice something, we can amend our project and add additional surveys in later if we need to. Mm -hmm. So that's really exciting too. Like 10, you know, five, 10 years down the road, if someone's still at the same email address, we can send them that survey to ask them how they're doing at this point. Are they still in the same profession? Mm -hmm. you know, those types of things, we'll be able to follow them. And this just, whew, fast. Really, we don't know what all is gonna happen yet. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, there's we had a lot of discussions about what all to include in this in the sure. initial batch of surveys, and we really wanted to zero in on these specific measures because the more important thing we knew was getting as many people, many respondents as possible to get the largest pool as possible. You know, so we didn't do things like the PHQ nine, we didn't do global functioning uh, measures uh, because there are some of those things we can go back and validate after the fact. But the more important thing is to look at this moral injury. Yeah. and be able to see moral distress, sorry, yeah. uh, be able to uh, start to get an understanding of what this is going to do to the profession going forward. Wow. Well, and I would invite you too, Doug, if you're, if you're able to, at the, with the research perch, to be able to put our links on there. That would be great so that people from, from this research perch could actually go right in and um, be a part of the study. Consider it done. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And, <laughs> and really, from from the whole profession, can I just uh, as a voice in that way, presumptuously, but but a deep thank you to, to you, to all three of you and your research team 
for doing this thing, for really serving the profession um, in such an amazing way. Thank you, thank you, thank you for what you're doing. Um, we will definitely put that out and, and uh, it's an important project that you're involved in and it's a moment in time where um, it, it has important uh, implications for all of us. So thank you. Yeah, thanks. thanks. Well, thank you everyone. Thank you for watching this. We will put a link at the end of this um, uh, uh, episode and please participate in this project. It's, a, it's really worthy of your time and your energy and it will benefit everyone. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this podcast, please consider donating to the Massage Therapy Foundation so that we can continue to bring you this and many other resources to increase your knowledge and improve your practice. Thank you.